Good morning and welcome to worship here in Hillsborough. When Alan Sleeth asked me to t take this service some time ago, neither of us imagined it would be a condition like this, but I'm very pleased to be here. Until last week I was sure I would have to apologise for the state of my hair and then my daughter, despite my considerable misgivings, decided to take it in hand and she has, I think, made me look at least, well, more than respectable. So much so I mightn't even bother with barbers in future. Just a couple of announcements. No dates yet been fixed for return to worship here in church, uh, but uh, you'll obviously be notified. And if you're thinking of wanting to come back the first Sunday, then please do get in touch with Dawn. And the only other thing is the Holiday Bible Club will meet virtually from Monday the 27th to Friday the 31st of July, and you can register online on the church website. Let us worship God. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our opening hymn, based on the 103rd Psalm, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Praise my soul. Rescues us from all our foes. 
Let us pray. Lord, we worship you, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We remember and praise you for your goodness to us, for your creating and sustaining purposes. We remember and bless you for every way in which you speak from the beginning of creation throughout countless centuries until today. We remember and praise you for your love revealed in so many ways, but supremely in your coming to us in Jesus Christ. And we recall with thanks his birth, his death, his resurrection. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory and praise forever. And as we worship, may we be very conscious of your presence wherever we are. And may our minds be open to your word, our hearts to your love. But we remember too our faults and failures. Our failures to place our hope in you. And sometimes we have let fear and anxiety overcome us. Our commitment to you has often wavered. We acknowledge those things we did and said that would have been better left undone and unsaid. We acknowledge the things we should have done and said but never bothered. Lord, you are forgiving to all those who have acknowledged their failures and you have mercy on will abundantly pardon those who return to you. So assure us, we pray, of your pardon and your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Give us peace in your service and in the world to come the joy of seeing your face through Christ our Lord who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the 55th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hear the word of God. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread? And your labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow came down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, So shall my word that goes out of my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress 
Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. Amen. As some of you might well imagine, I am very pleased that Michael Thompson is doing the young person's talk today. And after that, Alice Francie will sing King of Kings. Good morning. Now you don't have to change your quality video settings or anything like that. I have got my hair cut. I am looking far fresher and a little less homeless. So over the last few weeks, we have been looking at the theme of superheroes. And in the superhero movies, the superhero comes in and saves everybody, saves the day. And this week's theme is going to be no different. So we're going to start off with a wee question. Have you ever had to do something where you know people are going to make fun of you about? Here's a clip of me doing something that I didn't want to do, but I knew I had to. I am sure a lot of you at home were laughing at that clip and a lot of my friends took the mic out of me. They were winding me up, making fun of me and yeah, kind of deserved it. Wasn't a great dancer. But the reason I did it was because I knew God wanted me to do it. It was for his godly reasons that I decided to make an idiot out of myself in front of everybody. Sometimes God forces us to do things that we don't really want to do and we know we're going to open ourselves up for a bit of winding up. Some of our friends think that this thing that we believe in is just all made up and it's a load of rubbish, but we know deep down it's not. We just have to ignore that winding up and the taking the mick out of and just go on with it and live our lives that God wants us to. So we're going to look at a hero in the Bible who did this and his name is Noah. So Noah was a follower of God years and years ago and he was a great guy. He followed all the rules, he was a really nice fella and God really loved him. However, there wasn't too many people like Noah back then. Back then, the world was full of even more sin than it was today. Though there was killing going on, fighting, crimes being committed all the time, and God was hurt by what was happening. So God had a plan. He said, you know what, I'm gonna take a pause here. He asked Noah to go and gather up two of every animal and build this massive ark. Now, if you got told to go build a massive ark, You'd be thinking, okay, that's a pretty tough task. I don't know if I could do that. If I asked you at home to go and find two of every animal, oh my goodness, would you be at that for a while? But Noah said, you know what, I'm gonna do that. So for 50 years, Noah built this massive ark. Now just to put this into kind of size for you guys, if you had to put the ark somewhere, you would need three Olympic sized swimming pools, which pretty massive. So. Noah went ahead and did this, was building his ark, working away at this ark, but people were laughing at him. All these guys come on the streets saying, what's this guy doing? Building this massive ark for nothing? Like, the sun's out. What? It's not going to rain anytime soon. It's definitely not going to rain enough to lift this ark. But Noah trusted God's plan, kept working away, kept plugging away, and after 50 years, built this incredible ark. He brought on all the animals, two by two, and then something incredible happened that none of the people were expecting. 40 days of floods. God wiped out the earth. He wanted a restart, a reset, and said, you know what, let's start this again. And he gave Noah the opportunity to be the leader for this. So after 40 days and 40 nights of rain, and the ark getting lifted up, and everybody else getting wiped out, the rain stopped. Noah came off his ark with his family and all the animals to a world which is just unrecognizable to what it was before. So, God said, so obviously Noah was a bit nervous. He was thinking, oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? What, what, what happens if he asked me to go build another ark or anything like that? And God said, made him a promise. He said, Noah, I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to flood the world again. And to signify his promise, he put up this massive rainbow. And that is what we use today as a signal of hope. 
Whenever you see a rainbow, we think of hope and God's promise to look after us and be there for us. So you're probably wondering, well, where's the superhero part of this? Well, I'm going to tell you. We're going to focus on Noah for this part of the story and not God. Noah had this crazy, crazy request to go build an ark. And to be honest, someone that made, told me to build an ark, I'd be like, eh, I've got somebody else to do it. But Noah did it. Noah, even though he was getting wound up, bullied, picked off, he kept going. He showed bravery. You look at Captain America as a great example. Captain America wasn't that strong at the beginning. He wasn't muscly. He wasn't this ma amazing man that he is at the end. But the reason he became that was because of his attitude and his faith in his abilities and his faith in other people. He was a superhero and so was Noah. Noah trusted God, he put faith in God and he didn't, he ignored the bullying, he ignored everybody winding him up and he went to hell with it anyway. Sometimes we as Christians have to put ourselves in situations where we don't really want to be in. Trust me, I really did not want to dance last year and also didn't want to go into a fashion show. But I knew that there was a greater good for this. And when we were in Zambia, that greater good was shown to me with all the fantastic work we did there. Sometimes being a Christian means putting ourselves out there in a situation we don't want to be in. So we open ourselves up for criticism, open ourselves up from winding up. People saying, oh, that's not real, this isn't real. But we know what is real, we know the truth, we have the Bible, we can see it all there on a piece of paper. Those people who wind you up and are mean to you, we don't just cast them to the side and ignore them and, and you know try and shut them out. Go and preach to them, go and tell them about it. Now, I'm not saying you have to get a bell and ring it and tell them all, the, all quote them verse for verse, but do it in different ways. Bring them to Sunday school, bring them to our youth programs, and let them be a believer of God as well. We have to do things that put ourselves out of our comfort zone for God, but that's okay, and that's good, and that's just part of being a Christian. Wouldn't be, it couldn't be all plain sailing. Sometimes it's a bit wavy, it's a bit rocky, but the destination we're going for is better than any other destination you can ever imagine. So next time someone winds you up by being a Christian or doing something to do with being a Christian, just think of a rainbow and think of God's amazing promise to be there for us and care for us. Thank you.
The New Testament lesson will be read by Nigel Dunlop. That same day, Jesus left the house and went to the lakeside, where he sat down to teach. The crowd that had gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it. While the crowd stood on the shore, he used parables to tell them about things. Once there was a man who went out to sow corn. As he scattered the seeds in the field, some of it fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some of it fell on rocky ground where there was little soil. The seeds soon sprouted because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it burned the young plants and because the roots had not grown deep enough, the plants soon dried up. Some of the seed fell among thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the plants. But some seeds fell in good soil and the plants produced corn. Some produced a hundred grains, others sixty grains, and others thirty grains. And Jesus concluded, listen then, if you have ears. The hymn is, Lord, your word will guide us. of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Events in the Middle East have often hit the news headlines, not perhaps so much since the start of the coronavirus crisis, but it seems to be a place of great and continuous conflict and tension. Tension between Sunni and Shia, between Iran and Iraq, between Israel and Palestine. Tension within nations like Syria with what has become a horrific bloodbath. Or Yemen, where a rebellion threatens what's been described as the greatest humanitarian emergency with millions of people at risk. 
the whole area seems consumed by troubles and most of them will not be easy to solve. But that's hardly a new thing. The Middle East always seems to have been a sort of cauldron where competing nations and ideas clash. It was like that two and a half thousand years ago with three superpowers, Egypt, Babylonia and Assyria, all vying with each other. Which was a bit unfortunate for the small nations like Israel and Judah caught in the middle. Sometimes they entered into uneasy alliances with one or other of the big three. Sometimes they paid tribute in the hope that they'd be left in peace. The books of Kings are full of those stories. But in 712 BC, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and dispersed the inhabitants, the so-called Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom, Judah, survived for just about another hundred years when the Babylonians, now the top dog, attacked Jerusalem and destroyed it, demolished the city walls and the temple, carried its sacred vessels off with them, and also a considerable part of Judah's population in what has become known as the Babylonian captivity or the exile. It was a hard and a bitter experience, far from home and temple. The mood of the exiles is obvious from the 137th Psalm. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you. And some of you might remember a 1978 song by a group called Boney M, which was based on that psalm by the rivers of Babylon. And then there was another major shift in the politics of the region. The Babylonian Empire was overthrown by the Persians under Cyrus the Great. And in 538 BC, Cyrus decreed that the Jews could return home into Jerusalem. So after 50 years in exile, they began to return with great joy and high expectation and get to what must have seemed an uncertain future. Now, I wouldn't want to push too many parallels between the experiences of those who were in Babylon and ours over the past three months. Ours has been so much shorter. And no matter how difficult, it must have been excruciatingly difficult for many people. Generally, I think it was less traumatic than what the Jewish people endured in Babylon. And yet there perhaps was a sense of exile about our experience. We were cut off from family and friends, removed from many of our familiar activities, unable to do the sorts of things that we probably took entirely for granted. And as we emerge from lockdown, there's still much that is unsettled and uncertain. There's still a certain amount of fear hanging over us, especially when experts talk about the possibility of a second spike in the disease, even though that fear was very far from obvious among the milling crowds of people who were out in the streets celebrating. And yet, even if there is no immediate second spike, and we all pray there won't be, we're still going to be faced with restrictions. There are many questions unanswered about what we will or will not be able to do. For much of what we did in the past that was perfectly natural may be impossible. When, I wonder, will we be able to shake hands again or give someone a hug? No one knows. There is still uncertainty. It was that against the background of exile and return 
that were to understand chapters 40 to 55 of the book of the prophet Isaiah. These are powerful and prophetic and poetic chapters. They begin with the words that also begin Handel's Messiah. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. There are many people who need comfort right now. Those who have lost loved ones. Those who have lost work. Those who are highly anxious about what the future might hold. Those who are struggling, still struggling with some of the after effects of the virus. And Isaiah says, he will feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs in his arms. But he also paints a picture of a creating God. God who created everything and before whom the nations are like drops in a bucket. And this God cannot be compared to the carefully wrought idols that others worship. For he brings princes to naught and the rulers of the earth to nothing. And as I promise words we use at the beginning of this service, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. For he is in control of events. Isaiah recognized that it was God who raised King Cyrus to be the agent of freedom for his people. And these chapters also introduce the figure of the suffering servant, despised and rejected, wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and upon whom was the punishment that made us whole. And while there's been considerable scholarly debate about who Isaiah identified as the suffering servant. Most Christians traditionally have recognized him in Jesus Christ. All these things, all these points are meant to encourage and to guide the exiles as they returned home. The 55th chapter of Isaiah, which we read this morning, begins with an invitation to all thirsty people to come and buy and eat even if there's no money. Now, Isaiah is not denying the importance of eating and drinking, but he's hinting that there's more to life than just physical food. There is something that money cannot buy, but there's wine and milk, not just bread and water available, so that people who will listen and take this gift will be able to live properly the sort of abundant life Jesus spoke of. And he continues the invitation. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord. For he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The returning exiles would experience physical freedom, and liberation after years in captivity. But Isaiah expresses a need for a broader kind of freedom. Freedom from wicked ways and unrighteous thoughts. And in a neat little play on the word return, he goes beyond the return from exile to their own land to call on them to return to the Lord who would have mercy. And who will offer pardon. That sums up the relationship God wishes to have with his people. His readiness to offer them forgiveness. But there's also a warning. God's thoughts, says Isaiah, are not always the same as ours. Neither are his ways. They are as high above ours as the heavens are above the earth. I can't help feeling sometimes that even in the words we use in worship, there can be a tendency to see God as no more than a good pal who can be addressed casually. Of course he's a friend, but he's more than that. He is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. And this God, Isaiah 
talks about is a God who speaks. At the beginning of the creation and story in Genesis, the universe is a swirling chaos, and then God speaks. Let there be light. And there was light. And out of that chaos emerged order and creation. And God continued and continues to speak through prophet and wise man, but supremely in the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. And as God speaks, the effects of the word will not be overcome. His word will not return, that word again, to him without accomplishing his purpose. You know, I've often thought that puts a very heavy burden on any preacher. The parable of the sower makes the same point about the effects of the word. Sometimes in our preaching and in our thinking about this story, we concentrate almost entirely on the different types of ground into which the seed fell without ever managing to germinate. But the original point of the parable was probably Jesus assuring his listeners that there would be a harvest. Of course there would be difficulties, there would be problems. Some of the seed would have no effect, but much of it would grow and grow and yield a fine harvest in the kingdom. We can't see that growth always. Sometimes that frustrates us. But Jesus has actually made the point in another of his parables, the story of the seed growing secretly, that nobody sees the growth. It grows quietly, so with the kingdom. Its seed doesn't always have to be spoken words. What we do, how we obey Jesus in our lives, can also be a very effective seed in the kingdom. Over the past three months, the word has continued to be proclaimed using technology. And if we ever feel like uh, blaming the internet for most of the ills of the world, just remember, it was that internet that made the continuation of worship possible. I suppose over the past 12 weeks, I've listened to and watched more services of worship than at any other time in my life. And I've often admired the creative imagination that has been put into them. A creativity that isn't, I have to say, always there in our worship. And it also seems that more and more people have watched and listened to a service than would normally be in church on a Sunday. And I know that some of my friends have been amazed at the numbers who visited, even for a very short time, the services they were leading, far more than they'd ever see on a Sunday morning. Now, I suppose if it had been suggested a year ago that churches would be closed for a quarter of the year without any services, the reaction of many of us would have been incredulity, if not horror. But the experience, I think, hasn't been entirely negative. I was struck by some words last weekend by Andrew Foster, the Church of Ireland Bishop of Derry and Raffoe. Lockdown, he said, has reminded us of something we had already known. The church is not simply about a building. We've always said that. We've told the children at Sunday school that church is not a building. And yet so often we see God and church bound up in bricks and mortar. Lockdown has reminded us that we, the people of God, are something very different from bricks and mortar. That we're a family. And the family of God is worshipping and loving and serving. <coughs> I, I suspect there are a great many people who will be more than happy to go back to going to church, who will really rejoice when it is said to them, let us go to the house of the Lord. 
even though conditions for that will be very different. And a friend of mine remarked that she would certainly miss the fast forward button. Could she possibly have been thinking about sermons? But it would be a tragedy if we simply fail to reflect on what the last few months may have taught us about worship and about other things and how might some of those lessons could be put into practice. So this section of the book of Isaiah ends with a delightful picture. You shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and hills before you shall burst into song and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. I love that. Trees clapping their hands, mountains bursting into song, the whole of nature rejoicing in God and the sign he gives of his continuing presence. For instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The greater God, the enabling God, the Lord of history, the God who speaks and acts will lead and guide his people. And to his name be glory and praise. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness and your constant care, for your gift of life, for your guidance and provision. We thank you for our families and friends and all who support and help us. We bless you for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, for your presence through your Spirit, for your Church and all your means of grace. Lord, we remember the Church throughout the world, asking that its life may be renewed, its unity restored, its worship sanctified, and its witness empowered so that it may be an effective instrument for the extension of Christ's kingdom. And guided, we pray, as worship returns to church buildings, that it will reflect on what it has learnt over the past few months. We pray for your world, and particularly those places where there is conflict and tension, that these may be eased, that hostility will cease. And we remember before you all who have suffered and continue to suffer from violence. We pray for this community and those in positions of responsibility in Parliament and the Assembly as they continue to make difficult decisions. And as we move out of lockdown, give to every one of us patience and common sense. We remember those who work with the sick and vulnerable at home, in the hospital, in residential facilities, that they may be strengthened to do the work they have to and inspired by the knowledge they fulfil your purpose of caring and healing. We pray for those who are sick with COVID-19 and a multitude of other diseases, for the dying and the lonely, the bereaved, the anxious, and the fearful, for those concerned about their mental health. Lord, you know the needs of each one of them. May they be assured of your grace, which is enough for all those needs. And we remember your servants who have departed this life in your faith. And thank you for those who have influenced us to walk in your way. Give us grace to follow them as they followed Christ and bring us with them at the last to those things which eye has not seen nor ear heard, which you have prepared for those who love you. And all these are prayers we offer in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is a tremendous affirmation of where our hope is to be found 
in God. is an affirmation of where our hope is to be found in God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you this day and evermore. Amen.